Today's episode is episode 205 and today's episode is called The Map of Tiny Perfect Things. So today's episode is based on a movie I watched recently called The Map of Tiny Perfect Things. It's a movie, it's kind of like a remake of Groundhog Day, it's the same type of premise. The main character, he wakes up each day to a world where everybody is doing the same thing they did the day before and they forget the day before also. He's the only character that there's a continuation in his days, so he's progressing. He does eventually meet a girl who's also in the same situation as him. But what I found interesting that up until the point he met the girl, he had realized that initially a world like that is exciting because people forget the day before, so you can do anything you want. People will forget it. But after a while, he begins to realize that there's also a sense of isolation and loneliness that comes hand in hand with that as he has the same types of interactions with people day to day. There's no progression in his relationships. There's no sense of people getting to know each other. So that's the part of the experience that is challenging to deal with until he meets the female in this or the, the girl in this movie who is in the same boat as him, she is conscious every day. So she sees what's happening too. So this movie got me to think about real life, my life, other people's lives. It's easy to look at a movie like this and see it as pure fantasy, but the way I look at it, it's like an extreme version like a magnified version of a day-to-day reality that some people can experience. So the way I look at the people sleepwalking day-to-day or where their memory of the day before is completely blank, I look at it in the sense of people run by their habits and run by their goals and their priorities and just the unconscious drives that are driving them. That's the way I look at the hypnotized state of the people in the movie. And you can see that in real life also to varying degrees and also to varying degrees within ourselves. Within myself, there's varying degrees of unconsciousness. But this movie just got me to think about how it's challenging to live in that type of reality a reality where you're becoming more conscious you're starting to wake up to more of the patterns that have been driving you and you start to see more clearly those types of patterns in other people yet you can't wake them up so you've got this conundrum that the more you wake up the more you feel alive and the more you get a sense of yourself. But on the other hand, you might not have other people on the same path as you and it can be a challenge to find your way through that. So I was writing out some stuff today. A lot of questions kind of came to mind when I was thinking about this. A lot of questions came up for me. I'm just going to read out some of the questions that came up for me so i said in a world where people didn't sleepwalk what would conversations feel like because in in the movie the conversations he was having with the people who aren't conscious it was there wasn't uh, i guess a lot of depth to it and It was kind of people talking through their own patterns, their own patterns of behavior. I suppose the challenging part in this movie is that the people forget the other day what they talked about. So you're never going to have a continuation of a meaningful conversation because you're starting from scratch every day. 
So the conversation would just feel, I guess it would feel the same, even though the content might change day to day due to the fact that he would ask a different question or mention something different the next day. The quality feeling of the relationship probably wouldn't ever evolve because there's nothing substantial for it to grow from in terms of just the overall feeling to the conversation. So another thing that I asked myself, some question, another question that I wrote was, does standing out mean isolation and being viewed as strange and other in the eyes of others? So I don't know whether you've thought about this before, but it's something that I've been gradually, I guess, allowing into my awareness. It's my initial perception of myself through the eyes of other people. Something that happens very quickly. Yeah, it's not even something I'm very conscious of. All I go by is just this sense I have of being judged by other people. And if I take a step back from that, I realize that that's not necessarily the truth of the situation. It could be. It mightn't be. All I'm going off of is this sense I have of it. And that can be that I feel is tied to my perception of myself through the eyes of other people. So that's me thinking negatively of myself because I assume other people are thinking negatively of me because I'm standing out as different. I'm doing different things. I'm talking about different things to to other people. That's a part of that there. So. That's the question that came up for me. Does standing out mean isolation and being viewed as strange in the eyes of others? I honestly don't know, because I think you will be perceived as strange by other people, regardless of whatever path you take or however you are. There's going to be certain people that will view you as strange. But I guess there's different degrees to that. There is kind of a sense of somebody being a bit off, I guess, a bit strange. So that I think that can be unsettling. Kind of finding your way, navigating your way through life. Uh, I think that's probably part of the process that you can feel a bit strange. It's kind of tied to your individuality being slightly different to what's expressed collectively and you can think about that in terms of the interests of the community you're in the topics of conversations what people in the community value if that is quite different to what you talk about what you value what you focus on then there can be this feeling of being strange, being odd, being different to deal with. And you might say then, as you grow up as an adult, why don't you just move? Why don't you move to another location and find people that are similar to you? And that could be a potential solution. Another way of thinking about it, and perhaps more challenging, is perhaps people like you are needed where you are because there's more people like you than you think and they're just hidden in the same way that you hide yourself from other people your your true self your true interest your true uh, desires so that's another way to think about it and for me that would feel like if you're gonna have meaning to your life that would feel like a meaningful life that if you decided to show up as you are put in the work it's not something that is going to come easy. It's a gradual unfolding day by day, sticking with it. Just, just connect with who you are. Just the thought of that actually bringing hope to other people who might be without hope or might not know there's a different way to operate in the world. That, that that for me is something worthwhile doing and it's challenging and this is probably something you will face is just this sense of being odd because you're a bit different to the people around you. The other thing I think about in this movie 
the other way I view the people in this movie is that they're stuck in autopilot. So they go about their day not really being present and focusing on the person in front of them, the conversation they're having. So that's part of why the conversations are very similar day to day. There's no room for like being present, feeling the situation and letting it evolve. It's just they're run by unconscious scripts, which are based off of what they're valuing, what they're prioritizing, what's running their mind right now. And disconnected to my question around how would you live your life if someone else made up the rules? That's the first part. And then how would you live your life if you made up the rules to your life? So I think if you're listening to this, you're at a space already where you're mature enough to realize that isn't a childish way to operate because we're talking about talking about nuanced thinking. So come back to how would you live your life if someone else didn't make up the rules? It would be fairly unknown. I think you would probably allow yourself to feel more, to pay attention more, to not take things for granted as often. But if somebody else made up the rules, I think life would feel it would feel more constricted, more known. This would create the tendency to go into autopilot as you live in a world that you think is already figured out. It has these oftentimes binary ways of looking at the world. It doesn't give you a reason to be present and to pay attention. So that's how the autopilot can kind of start to consume your life. The other problem with it is that when you live in a world where someone else makes the rules, there's very little room for nuance. And there's ample opportunities for institutions to shove their doctrine down your throat as you look outside yourself for the answers all the time. So all of that is creating an environment that makes you overlook small details in your life makes you overlook the fact that you don't really know who you are and that that can be exciting like life can actually be exciting it can be about discovering who you are through all the different trials tribulations and moments of joy in your life like for me that feels more like a life worth living it would give me more of a reason to be present more of a reason to want to get to know people in my environment in the place i'm living the other thing when you are living in someone else's world i think it gives you more of a reason to give a lot of power to objects in the world in the form of just objects material objects and people I think you start to kind of constrict yourself and manipulate yourself to optimize your life in terms of how you picture what a happy and successful life would look like. And that picture oftentimes comes from someone else's rules. So all in all, that was an interesting question to kind of come up. The other thing I guess is that when you delegate your thinking like that, I think there's more opportunities for your life to become, to feel boring and uninteresting. I guess it's just it's just a sense of like playing it safe, don't be seen, don't express yourself in any way differently, by by the rules, conform, behave, all those things. So there were some of the questions I asked myself today when I started thinking about the topic of today's episode. Then there was just a general process that I started writing out based on the stages of grief. 
so I think with grief, you go through different stages of grief. There's like a denial phase until eventually you reach an acceptance stage. So I, I kind of wrote out something similar in terms of waking up. So when you start waking up to things that are running your life unconsciously, I think first there's a denial phase because when you start waking up to how your life is right now and how how unconscious a lot of it is, there's an unsettling feeling that perhaps your life isn't what you thought it was. Perhaps the people in your life aren't the people you thought they were. That's an unsettling feeling to sit with. So the initial impulse is to deny that realization, deny that insight, just so you can just keep on living the life you know, because at least that's familiar and it feels safe. So that's the denial phase of waking up. Then there's like a grief stage where I guess depending on your insights, you realize that the denial phase isn't working for you anymore because you can't unsee what you've seen through the insights you've seen. And so there's a grief phase where you are saddened at the life you knew that you've now lost a lot of big portions of it. Big portions of what you thought you knew have just evaporated. So there's a certain amount of grief that comes with that, that there's a slight sense of, I wasted a vast proportion of my life. And then there's another sense of just confusion there, general confusion about like, what is this life? What, what, what the hell went on? So in that phase, yeah, things are disorienting and uh, a natural amount of sadness to that. That uh, I guess you get naturally anyway, you get it with different stages of life anyway. So if, if you're someone who gets married, has children, that's going to affect your identity, your sense of who you are. Like you're going from one day being a person who didn't have children to the next day you're now a dad or a mother. And that takes up a big portion of your reality now. That's like a base layer of your reality that was never there before. So I think those events happen in your life anyway that will make you question, that can, not necessarily you will do it, but it can make you question just the ideas you had about who you thought you were. There's many different things that happen in life that can make you question that. I guess even war, when war comes about, that makes you question, like, what what have I been believing my whole life? Like, it makes you question that a bit more when you realize, I suppose, when you come to terms in your day-to-day reality that, like, things can change in the blink of an eye and it's, uh, it's very unsettling. Like, I... I still feel unsettled with that. It, it gets, it's, it's liberating in a way, but it's also very unsettling. So that's why just the idea of debt as well is very unsettling because you don't know what to expect from that. They're unsettling ideas, but because you're on the path there to waking up instead of just living, being run by your scripts, it's, this is part of the process. Like, this is a... Uh, This is just part of it, I think. So this is just general things that I'm kind of talking about here. This isn't a formal, these are the stages of waking up to yourself. This is something I wrote down today, just thought might be a bit interesting to share some thoughts around this. Then another part of this, and even on these stages, they're not actually in a sequence because I wrote down the next part, acceptance, then I wrote brute force, then I wrote acceptance again. But I'm just going to go to the brute force part here. This is when you're starting to wake up to things and you're starting to see them in other people. And you try the brute force approach to waking people up to their thinking. And that's a difficult period because you don't yet know that when it comes to beliefs, we're not rational, we're not logical beings at all. We stick with what's familiar. Generally, people will stick with what's familiar. 
especially if it's been ingrained in them for years and years and years. They're not going to change their mind in the blink of an eye. I even see that within myself. I have certain beliefs today that some of them are unconscious, some of them are more conscious, and it's, it's hard to, even if there's certain beliefs that aren't working for me, it's still hard to change them because they just feel so familiar to me, so part of my reality. So with this brute force at, uh, attempt, you don't realize that yet, you don't see that in yourself, but then after a while you start to realize, I'm just making this worse. And it's this it ties into this principle of what you resist will persist. So you're resisting people being the way they are because you, you feel like they should be another way. And creates a bit of conflict there for a while until you realize that let people be. Then you got the acceptance phase. So you, you're gradually starting to accept yourself. I think that goes hand in hand as you're gradually starting to get a sense of yourself. Because it's all well and good to say accept yourself, but might have no idea who the fuck am I and uh, I don't think for me anyway I don't think I will ever get a full hold on just an understanding of myself but the more I'm honest with myself the more of a sense I get of myself so that's part of the acceptance part there and you start eventually then it's the accepting other people as they are and then just listening to to them more more often than you did before the continuation continuous process so that ties back to at the very start where i started off in this meandering conversation or monologue when i mentioned it about the quality feeling of the of the conversation and being present in the conversation that's where it all ties back to here at the very end when you start listening to other people in order to really listen to someone you have to be present pay attention to them that's active listening. So that's the final part in the waking up to yourself process. That's the giving back part. So you're understanding your life a bit differently. You're receptive to different insights about life, but you're not shoving them down people's throats. What you're doing with the active listening part is that you're just facilitating a space where people can have their own insights and can experience a bit more clarity of mind in their own reality too because the world is complex and so much stuff that's ambiguous and I think that's the maturation pr process of a person is facing the ambiguous qualities of life and engaging with it and not ignoring it and not covering it up with simplified binary black and white thinking that you can find in institutions and society at large that in the long run, I think, just lead to a lot of judgment of people, a lot of conflict and a lot of mental health issues too, I think, with people. So that's the main things I just covered today. Some questions that I wrote out today in the coffee shop and some just a, a bit of a process there based on the stages of grief. So that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks again for listening. 